Welcome to the All For Your Life podcast, where you can write a new script for your life and become the hero of your story. I'm your host, David McRae. You are the author of your life. Let's get started. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. It is not our abilities that show what we truly are. It is our choices. Before we launch into the podcast, I'd like to tell you about my book, All For Your Life, Become the Hero of Your Story. This is a book for people who are at a crossroads in life and want to make a fresh start. Judging by the fact that you're listening to this podcast, I suspect that you may well be one of those people. This book is going to help you to change your narrative and rewrite the scripts in life that are holding you back. This book covers the latest science and research showing you how to become the person you want to be and live the life that you want to live. I'd like to invite you to get this book, not only because I feel it's a great book that's going to help you, but also it's going to support the podcast as well. I love podcasts, but sometimes all of those ads that you get can be really irrelevant and annoying when you just want to listen to a good piece of training or a good interview. So I therefore made the decision with my podcasts that number one, I wanted my podcast to be free so that everyone could listen to it. And number two, that I wasn't going to fund it through all these annoying and irrelevant adverts and commercials. Therefore, if you want to support the podcast and support all the things that I put out there for free, whether it be here on the podcast, my YouTube channel, other areas on social media, then buying a book is going to enable and help that process. So this is what we call a win-win scenario. By buying the book, you help to support my work and all the free stuff that I put out there. And you also get a really transformational book that's going to help you make those changes that you really want in your life. So if you feel you're someone who's at that crossroads in life, you're looking for a new direction, you're looking for a fresh start, then make sure you get this book. Author Your Life, Become the Hero of Your Story is available on Amazon in ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Whatever your preferred medium, it's there for you to go get right now. Hello, story changers, and welcome back to another episode of the Author Your Life podcast. In today's episode, we have an interview with Liam McKelvey. Liam is a quad amputee who believes that everybody can achieve their goals and ambitions irrespective of how many limbs they have. After contracting meningitis as a young child, he has had to adapt and overcome challenges in order to live his everyday life. His experiences have helped him craft an attitude of positivity, self-belief and resilience and he is now looking to spread this to others. By embracing certain mindsets, Liam has overcome seemingly impossible challenges and believes that these attitudes can be embraced by anybody. Liam is now a motivational speaker who teaches his no limits philosophy. In this interview, you will learn the greatest limitations are the ones you place upon yourself, how to defeat negative self-talk, the value of being delusional, why to never take no for an answer. You'll learn this and so much more in this interview with Liam McKelvey. Liam, welcome to the All For Your Life podcast. Well, Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on, Liam. We were, we were just chatting um, before we, we went online that this has been a little while in the making. We've had a few false starts with this interview. So I'm glad to be here with you today. And I think this is going to be a really interesting one for the, the people who are listening. And I'd like to really hand over to you in this regard. And would you mind sharing with us a little bit of your story of what's taken you to where you are today and, and the work that you're doing now today as well? Yeah, um, currently I am a, well, primarily I'm a motivational speaker. I'm also looking into doing workshops and possibly even one-to-ones. And uh, there's quite a long story behind how I ended up a speaker. Because uh, initially I was actually an architecture student, but that didn't work out for me. But in order to give you the full context, I'll go way back to the beginning. It was the day before my second birthday, I, uh, I fell ill with meningococcal septicemia which is basically a hybrid of meningitis and sepsis. And apparently it's practically unsurvivable. 
I live in Dundee, Scotland, and uh, my family took me to the hospital in Dundee when they noticed a rash on my tongue. And uh, I was instantly diagnosed with men with cococcal septicemia. It's a tongue twister, as I always struggle to say it. <laughs> and uh, they realised that they couldn't treat me in Dundee, so they put me in an ambulance and they actually gave me a police escort through to Glasgow. Now, by the time we arrived in Glasgow, the condition had worsened to the extent that the doctor said that this was the worst case that they had seen in years, if not decades, and said that any chance of survival was practically non-existent. And they said, however, if he does survive, which won't happen, but if he does, he'll likely be so brain damaged he won't be able to see speaker here. So they went to the drawing board, started thinking of ways to try and save my life. And the way medical concept to see me works is that for the most part, it starts at the fingertips and the toe tips, and it kind of it blocks the blood flow, it clots the blood. So the limbs start dying off, and it gradually makes its way up your limbs towards your vital organs, at which point it kills you. So one of the actions that they took in order to stop the disease was amputating all four limbs. And uh, thankfully, that, that did the trick, it stopped the disease. But uh, I now had to learn to live the rest of my life without limbs. So I had the right arm amputated through the elbow, the left arm amputated above, and both legs below the knee. And well, that was it forevermore. So uh, yeah, I, I had a relatively normal childhood in truth. I went to a mainstream school, had a mainstream education. I don't think anybody in my class really seen me as that different because I just kind of found my way of doing things. I, uh, I can write and draw just like everybody else, hold the fork and knife, <laughs> just by holding my two arms together. I can even pick up a glass. Yeah. Take a drink of water. Actually, I live in my own house and the only adaptation in the entire flat is the, the cords on the blinds. When they arrived were too high, I couldn't actually reach them. Ah. <laughs> to be honest, most people with hands couldn't either. Yeah. So uh, I got my granddad to tie a, a bit of string to extend them down to my height. But uh, other than that, the house is completely unadapted. So I get by quite well. So yeah, it's, uh, I got myself through school <coughs> and uh, eventually I went to university to study architecture. And after two years, I started to struggle with it, I started to struggle with the workload. Actually, I injured my real leg on a study trip through Northwest Europe. And I had to take a week off university in second year, at the start of second year, and uh, I fell behind. And I work at a slightly slower pace than everybody else. It's not too bad, it's still quite fast, but it's enough for the gap to gradually increase as each week passes. So by the time Christmas came around, I was in over my head, swimming against the tide. And uh, I start to blame myself, I start to blame my disability, I start to say, if I had legs, I wouldn't have gained the injury that took me off for a week. And if I had hands, I'd be able to catch up. And I started to adopt this sort of defeatist attitude and I, I blame my own body, which is obviously never going to change. So eventually I got myself through second year, I somehow miraculously passed, I don't know how. I was a low mark, but still, I could have went on to third year, but. I thought that this has taken quite a bad toll on me. I, I, I didn't want to go on with it. My mental health was completely destroyed. I was sleeping in 12-hour shifts of the five days of the week that you're meant to go into university. You, you were lucky if I showed up for one. So, yeah, I dropped out. I was unemployed for a year. And I, I kept spiralling into this deep depression because I no longer had any purpose in life. I, I didn't have any direction. I didn't know what it was that I wanted to do. The one thing that I did want to do was be an architect, but I, feel, I felt that my disability stood in the way of that. So I said, my disability is never going to allow me to do anything in life that I want to. And that was my mindset, and it kind of fed on itself, and I got worse to the, to the point that I actually ended up on antidepressants and seeing a psychologist. It took me a year to work up the courage to eventually start applying for jobs. And uh, I was just in the mindset of anything I'll do, just anything to get me out of this unemployment, something. And it was quite a negative mindset looking back on it, but I applied for many jobs, didn't really hear back from any. I got one interview 
And that interview was for, there was two spaces and there was three people put forward for interviews. And I came out of the interview and I thought, I've aced that. I said, there's no way I can't get this job. In truth, I was slightly overqualified. I thought, I've got what I need. And uh, I was the one guy that didn't get yeah, to do oh, jobs. <laughs> That's when I realised that, hang on, this, this is going to be difficult. Because I could sit in an interview, interview room and tell the interviewer that I can do things just as well as you can until I'm blue in the face. But sometimes they'll struggle to kind of see beyond the disability. And it's quite a risk to employ somebody like me. So they're safer just going for the option of the guy with hands. So that was like a kick between the legs in truth. And again, I was starting to think I'm never going to be able to do anything. And it was one day I was sat, it was a Sunday, I remember, and I had the house to myself. This is before I moved out. I had the house to myself and I thought, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to be productive. And I'm going to find not just a job, but something with a career behind it, a bit of direction. And I opened up the laptop. And before you could type in Indeed, I ended up on YouTube because I've got the attention span of <laughs> it. And uh, I was watching a TEDx video about finding purpose, and it was uh, Adam Leipzig, I believe. I think that was his name. I can't quite remember. And uh, I thought, this, this is quite relevant. Perhaps this will help me. Clicked on it, and I watched it. And it was like a 12-minute video or something like that. And I had it paused halfway through because I figured out what I was going to do. The, uh, the first question he asked was, what experiences or qualifications do you have? And I thought, well, if I had to pass an exam to leave school, I'd probably still be there. I was thinking too literally about it. I've never had a job in my life. But then I thought, I've got a lot of experiences with the, the highs and lows of life. The sort of resilience, having to get back up every time life kicks you between the legs and having to just keep going, keep churning out, keep grinding. And, uh, but I thought, well, what's that going to do? That's not a career. And uh, the next question was, how can you use your experiences or qualifications to impact your life or the lives of others in a positive way? And I thought, I don't know, I might talk about it, something like that. Then a light bulb went off in my head. I realised that I was watching a video of a guy talking about his experiences and his knowledge and inspiring other people to take positive action in their life. And I thought, perhaps I can do the same thing. It was in that moment that I realised that I've had a lot of experiences in life, both good and bad. And with experiences come lessons, but why do the lessons just have to be for me? So that's, that's when I decided to become a speaker. But I, I didn't know if that was a thing. I'd never heard of that. <laughs> it's, it's not the sort of thing you walk into a job centre and say, right, I want to be You don't vote. find it on Indeed, do you? <laughs> so I... Uh, I googled to see if it was a thing. I googled the exact term amputee motivational speaker and a guy called Nick Vucic pops up. I'm not sure if you've heard of him, but he's an amputee who's lost all four limbs to a lesser extent than my left arm. My first thought was, oh, I've been outdone. <laughs> so I can't compete with that. But I, eventually I came to my senses and I realised that, you know what, if he can do it, why can't I? This guy's living the dream. He's emigrated to California and the lot. So, uh, yeah, I thought, do you know what? If you see somebody else in a situation that you wish to get yourself into, then why not take inspiration from them and see how they did it? So mm -hmm. that set me off on the journey. And here I am about a year and a half later speaking to you. Brilliant. There's, there's lots of different things I'd like to, to pick up from that account. And, uh, and you tell it so well as well. Uh, I think there, there is a, a speaker within you, definitely. And the first thing, actually, it's quite a simple question. Why architecture? What drew you towards that in particular? I've always been design-minded. I don't know what it is. It may be something to do with growing up without any limbs. You have to kind of problem solve all the time. But I've always loved design and drawing and stuff like that. I remember when I was, uh, when I was younger, I had a bedroom full of more toys than you would ever need as a child. <laughs> The one toy that was my sort of my faithful toy throughout every single year was a was a, as a drawn board. I used to draw, design this, that, the next thing. It would be clothing, it would be cars, it would be buildings, it would be floor plans, it would be 
anything really, just anything to do with design. And uh, eventually, sort of going through the teenage years, I realised that I was kind of interested in property. Sort of, like, I like programmes, like grand designs and stuff like that. And I thought, you know what, why not, why not become an architect? And I've always been quite interested in architecture. So, for example, if I go abroad, I, uh, if I go on a city break, it's usually based on like, the, the aesthetics of the place, like Prague, Paris, Lisbon, places like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was a... Uh, Architecture seemed to be the one. Uh-huh. You also mentioned this self-talk that arose when you started to face difficulty and you started to face challenge and, you know, <laughs> flipping hell, don't we all get that as soon as a bit of challenge in adversity comes in and all of these excuses and, and, and limiting beliefs and, and defeatist talk starts to emerge in us. Did you find anything that was helpful in overcoming that self-talk? Is there anything that you use now when inevitably that little voice starts speaking up in the back of your head? Yeah, the, uh, I, the part I forgot to mention in the story was I first struggled with mental health as a teenager quite severely. And then towards my late teens, I kind of improved. I, I, I managed to deal with it in a way. And when I say deal with it, what I mean is suppress it to the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that wasn't the most effective way to deal with things because it did pop up again, like you said, towards the end of university and in unemployment because I've just kind of painted over those cracks in the past that, that they arose again. So uh, what I realised was a game changer for me was when I decided to become a speaker, I was still struggling with it. And what really changed my attitude was self-improvement. So it was this time last year I started investing in sort of self-help audiobooks. And that's when I kind of realized sort of everybody has this potential within them. They just kind of need to realize it themselves. And from there on, I realized that every single problem in my life could be dealt with in one way or another. And even if I couldn't fix it, I could find a way to deal with it. And so, yeah, self-help is definitely the, the sort of that and asking for help. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I spent last year, a lot of last year, speaking to a psychologist. I've now been discharged. But um, that kind of helped me. Because as well, when I struggled with mental health problems, I was primarily anxiety and depression. I'd never, well, I dealt with it before, but I'd never overcome it, overcome it. So I didn't know how to deal with it. It was kind of beyond yeah. my level of knowledge. So, in order, so to speak with a psychologist, somebody who's dealt with this in many different cases, to sit down and actually logically talk through my problems and things that we could do in order to try and help myself, that was a game changer. Unfortunately, the antidepressants didn't work for me. I had to come off of them, but I believe that it depends on the person. For some people, that's they need the antidepressants to function. But in my case, it didn't work out. But I, I had to try that to know that. So uh, th- there's no shame in asking for help. I believe that actually, if there's anything in my life looking back on it, the thing that took the most co- courage was probably asking for help. Was probably saying, well, you know what, I'm a wee bit out of my depth here. I-, I need somebody to help me because if I don't get help, this is only going to get worse. And it's going to pop up again, just as it has done. So, yeah, a combination of asking for help and uh, self-help, self-improvement, that sort of thing. Yeah. At this time also, you were starting to enter a little bit of a rut. University was difficult. You eventually didn't continue into your third year. You go into this job hunting scenario, which is just the most soul-destroying thing ever everyone's been in that job hunting position and it just it sucks the life out of you it really does and for a lot of people they get stuck in these types of ruts whether it's due to their career or their relationships or their lifestyle do you have any suggestions as to what is helpful to get you out of a rut when you realize you're in it i think recognizing that you're in a rut in the first place is half the battle to be honest Because a lot of people just kind of keep going through a situation that they don't like or they can't seem to get out of without just just in a a daze. 
just in this kind of subconscious state they just keep on and all that when you actually recognize that you know what i'm what the way i'm acting is not in my best interests i've got to do something about that i think that's half the battle in itself mm -hmm. the, the other half of the battle is just uh taking time to understand what it is that you want in life i i, I didn't know for years Sometimes I still question it. Sometimes if this is this really what I want, yeah, and I actually sit down and figure out why I want to do this. Because if you know why you do something, you'll see it out. You'll go through. I think it was Nietzsche that said, "I'm going. I'm going to completely butcher this quote here." Is that he who knows why will endure anyhow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah another so, one. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I realized that. Do you know what? That's you direction I'm taking myself in. I want to have a positive impact on the world. I want to show people that even if you're missing all four limbs, you have the possibility to do something with your life that you enjoy. And because that's my reason, I, I'm never going to give up on this now because it's embedded in me. But yeah, if, if you're stuck in a rut, it suggests that you, you're possibly doing something that you don't want to do deep down. It's, it's, it's perhaps yeah. just snapping yourself out of that and saying, you know what, I need to change something here. And telling yourself that, yeah, that's half the battle, I believe. Yeah, that's a really good point you just made towards the end there. I was uh, speaking to my wife a, a couple of nights ago, and I was saying most people are unhappy in the world because they lose their idealism and their, their optimism for, for the future. And I think, I think all of us have an idealistic vision of things that we don't know about. So for example, when you, when you start a business, you think, oh, business is going to be easy and I just need to put this out into the world and here's the clients that I'd work with and here's how much money you, that I would make. And then you get three months into it, you get a year into it and you go, oh, this was not what I expected at all. And if I'd known it was going to be like this, I probably wouldn't have done it. And I think this, this happens for all of our major ventures in life that we, we have this idealism, but I think that's really good because I think sometimes people lose that idealism and when they do, that's when I think we have the biggest cause of unhappiness in the world. I think the biggest cause of unhappiness in the world is that people lose that idealism. They lose that optimism and aspiration for their lives. And so they either settle for things that are okay, fine, not bad or they put up with stuff they put up with stuff that is that is bad that is negative that is stressful because all because they lost that idealistic vision of what is possible and what could be just as you were you were saying there as well mm -hmm. uh, dare to dream but uh, yeah yeah it's uh people need a feeling of safety as as, as built into us it's a uh, not tribal, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, primal. Primal, that's primal, it. Yeah. It's this primal instinct that we have, we need safety. So a lot of us go through life just kind of taking the easy option, the, the secure job, and just kind of doing what everybody says is just what you need to do, right? You need to settle down, have your children, get married, get a job, that sort of thing. And a lot of people, deep down, they don't want to, but they just say, ah, say, oh, do you know what, I don't want to take that risk. What if I start a business and go bankrupt? What if I do that and this goes wrong? They always people will always find excuses in order to stay in their comfort zone. And the things with excuses will always make them seem as if they're valid reasons. Mm -hmm. I can't do that because I've not got money, I've not got time, I've got children, I've got other commitments. You can't argue with that. So yeah, I, I believe that, that this uh, this vision I've got of my future. I, I, I don't mind being optimistic with it, even sometimes slightly delusional. <laughs> it gives you some. It gives you a target to to aim towards. If you can't see your target, how can you hit it? Yeah. And yet, there's there's lots of people out there that are completely extremely discontented with their life because they want more, but they're too scared to take that action. But sometimes you have to face your fears and to take a step beyond your comfort zone because. If, if you do every, you are the product of everything you have done up to now. So in order to be something more, you must do something you've never done before. 
you must push yourself beyond your comfort zone and learn new skills a new direction but I, I know even from personal experience I, that, that feeling of for example last year even telling my family that I was going to go self-employed as a speaker I just felt the voice heard the voice in the back of my head saying that, that's a stupid what are you doing this for so you can't do this so I, you've never run a business before so don't be silly so I take it easy it is, but I'm glad I took that step I'm glad I dreamed that I had this vision because a year later I'm in a place that I would never imagined it would have been a year ago and if every year like is like that who knows where I'll be in 10 years time so yeah I did dare to dream as well so. yeah absolutely I loved what you're saying about even being a little bit delusional like great things are delusions until they happen putting a man on the moon delusional putting a computer in your pocket delusional giving people the vote who've never had the vote before delusional but we've made all of those things happen because somebody was delusional enough but also idealistic enough to actually pursue that project and pursue that aspiration and ultimately as we know now all those things are no longer delusions they're realities you transform your delusion into reality when you when you follow that optimism and and act upon it and work towards it it's only impossible until somebody does it for the first time yeah um there's there's a story that people often say about roger bannister um running the the four minute mile and people thought oh nobody could do it and then as soon as he did it like seven people did it within the next 12 months and like a high school student did it like five years later or something. As soon as you break that barrier, then you suddenly have a new barrier. You kind of, you move the, um, you move the, I've lost the word as well here. You move the, it's like when you move the bar up when you're doing the, the high jump and you say, well, actually now I can jump that high. So let's see if we can jump this high. Let's see if we can jump this high and you can just build it up from that. That's even what I aim to do with my, uh, with my career as a speaker is just saying to people, look, do you know what? I've, I've no hands, I've no feet. Yeah, I live in my own house. That's practically unadapted. I run my own business. Yeah, I can believe that. When you told me that, by the way, I assumed, <laughs> oh, you have all these awesome adaptions, and this is how I do this, and this is how I do this. Yeah, that's amazing. I always imagined if I was ever to live on my own, it would be an extremely adapted house. So I've even taken myself by surprise. Here. <laughs> so it's just kind of using that example to say to people, do you know what? If I can do, you can do. It's, it's sometimes you've just got to push yourself a little bit further. Sometimes you've just got to think outside the box. Sometimes you've just got to grin and bear it. There's going to be situations in life where that make you feel uncomfortable. They even put you in a bit of pain. But if you can keep going in the face of this, in the face of this pain, you'll come out the other end as a stronger person. So <laughs> the, the example I use for this is throughout my childhood in particular, I had a lot of surgery. I, uh, my summer holidays were always sacrificed to surgery. I, I never understood why they couldn't do it in term time, but I didn't get to choose. <laughs> um, it never really got on top of me. I, 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 there, was a lot, there was a few times I would lie there in the hospital bed in agony and think, why me? Why, what, what is life? What is the point? I now realise that, do you know what? If I could come through all of that as a child, a young child, I could come through almost anything. And that's now how I face my problems. At any time that I, over, I face a new problem in my life, I almost naively assume that one day I'm going to overcome this somehow because I've, come, I've overcome worse things. And it's, it's just teaching other people, like, oh, do you know what, in life there's going to be tricky situations, but if you come out the other side, you come out a stronger person, you can deal with your hard times better in the future. You can perhaps even help other people like I am. Yeah, absolutely. There's something you you said a little while ago. You are talking about how people always take the easy choice and the easy decision. They do that over and over again, and it it puts them in this place that they're they're not happy with. And it made me think about this decision point that you had in university, where you finished second year. You've actually qualified for third year you could go on and do that if you wish and all of the societal messaging and pressure will be 
on you making that choice and going on and doing that third year, well, you're throwing away a great opportunity, a great education. Architecture is a good career. You like architecture. Why don't you, you try it? Stick it out for another year and see how you do. There's, there's all this messaging and pressure that would come to you at that point. And I imagine that was a difficult decision to make, even though you knew in your heart which was the right decision to make for you. It still must have been difficult. And this wasn't the only difficult decision over your life, that I'm sure. Do you have a process for when you face these difficult decisions that helps guide you as to what path you should take? <laughs> Uh, you know what, that, that's, in recent years, the most, I've, I've not had to make many difficult decisions since I became sweet. Actually, that's complete, that's nonsense. I've had, I've had many difficult decisions based on running <laughs> a business, I suppose. But um, I suppose when I came to the university thing, I, I just did what felt right to me. I suppose, yeah, as well with the business, when it comes to my speaking career, again, it just, it's, it's almost like a gut feeling. It's kind of a combination between a gut feeling and you using common sense in your head, thinking, if I do this, what is the consequence going to be? You can always choose your actions in any circumstance. You don't always get to choose the consequences. So it's just kind of thinking through what the consequences are going to be. So when I came to the, the crossroads at the end of second year in university, I, I try, I, my, my gut instinct was, I can't do this. I need to drop out now. But in my head, I was thinking, well, I've, I've worked hard to get to this point. However, if this is just second year of university and it's completely broken me, how am I meant to follow a career with this? In my entire life of trying to chase deadlines, and at least with university, if you fell behind, you could catch up. But if, as an architect, if you're working, if I, you've got a client breathing down your neck wanting the drawings finalised or something like that. There's not many excuses that you can make. So I, I realised in my head that it's going to be quite a tough career if I follow this on. So between the combination of the gut feeling and the, the sort of thinking it through in my head, I came to the conclusion that dropping out was in my best interests. And the same way that nowadays with my speaking career, any time that I so towards the end of last year, for example, my uh, my booking started to drop severely and my online influence kind of dropped and I fell away from uploading things. And actually, sometimes I lie down on my couch in pitch darkness <laughs> and just think. And I try to think about logical ways of doing things. And that, that's, that's my process. I just kind of, I think about different actions that I can take and then I kind of deconstruct them to see what each consequence could possibly be and based on that just come to come to a conclusion so focusing a little bit more now on the day-to-day -day process and you've been on this new exciting journey over the last year and as you said you've been uh, again more into the, the self-development audios and and finding out a little bit more about well how can I sort of approach day-to-day -day as a better version of myself and uh <laughs> this is quite a funny question because before we came on we were talking about how for both of us our routines have been absolutely shattered <laughs> at the beginning of the year they've not been how either of us have wanted them to be but generally speaking what are you doing on a regular basis that helps you show up to feel yourself to perform and approach that day-to-day week-to-week as best as you possibly can <laughs> Like I was telling you before we started recording, the last month of my life has been upside down. Because I said I, I hadn't had a cold in like a year and a half. And I've had two pretty severe ones in the last month. Plus Christmas time and schedules are back to front anyway at that time yeah. of year. and Everything was completely out of whack. So I've done like no work for the last month. I'm like the complete opposite of the person that I preach about. But I, I, I told myself, you know, I'm the kind of person I like to start on a Monday morning or the first of a month or the new yeah. year. So I, I don't know what it is, but like a Sunday night kind of excites me because I know I'm going into a new week. So I thought, right, new year, new month, new decade, new me. I'm going to just go hit the ground running. And uh, <sighs> didn't happen. <laughs> I was telling you that uh, last weekend, my sleeping schedule was 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. 
and th- this entire week almost has been a write-off. I got up early deliberately on Monday, like at, I think it was eight o'clock in the morning, which compared to four in the afternoon, two days previous, yeah. quite early. And I, I was like, right, that's it. I'm going to start, I'm going to start. I did two hours working, fell asleep on the couch. So, yeah, now what I'm doing in order to get myself back into the routine is actually not trying to just wake up on time one morning and just hit the ground running. I'm now kind of easing myself back into the schedule. So yesterday I woke up at 2 p.m. Today was 12. Tomorrow I'm going to try 10. Sunday I'm going to try 8. And hopefully I'm going to keep it at 8 o'clock from there on. Because I've always been quite an all-or-nothing guy. I say, right, I start now and I do everything right first time. And then it doesn't work out like that. <laughs> and it's, it's quite easy to lose motivation when you don't get it right first time. So sometimes you just need to stick at it and gradually ease yourself into it. So I, what I've realised in my case, to wake up early, what wakes me up is putting my phone at the other side of the bedroom. So when my alarm goes yeah. off, I have to get up. I'll leave a pint of water and I'll drink the pint of water and like one, like down it in one. And then I'm going to be honest at this point, I could probably collapse because I'm that tired that I'm not a morning person. I'll actually go back to my bed, but I'll listen to a podcast. I'll listen to like an hour long podcast and I'll lie there and kind of just, that'll kind of motivate me to get up. It always works. One time I listened to a Tony Robbins podcast first thing in the morning and it took me from completely shattered to, hang on, I'm going to get up and have a cold shower. I've never done that. <laughs> so it's just kind of changing your environment to work to your benefit. And in my case, when it comes to getting up, it's leaving a glass of water, the phone at the other side of the room, listening to a podcast, easing myself into it. I don't understand how people can sort of set an alarm and just get up like that and just go about their day. I've, I, I can't do that. I've tried it in the past and I've failed miserably. So it's kind of understanding that what, how you like to do things. Some people can get up straight out of bed. Some people need to put their alarm at the other side of the room. It's about understanding what works for you. So it's the same, not just the same with any, it's not just getting up, it's the same with anything. It's, if you're learning any new habit or you're trying to motivate yourself, try and change your surroundings. Try, just try and change your surroundings so that they help you. Sometimes if I lose motivation halfway through a day, again, I'll listen to a podcast or watch a motivational video online, listen to an audio book, something like that just to kind of kickstart me again because your surroundings definitely have an impact on yeah, there's something I say a lot to people at this time of the year, January, and everyone wants to do their New Year, New Year's resolutions, New Year, New Me, and and so often the common one is is exercise, health kind of related. So I say to people for like exercise and fitness, things like when you wake up in the morning, however quickly it is that you wake up, put your trainers in front of your bedroom door. And that way you literally can't leave your bedroom without falling over your trainers. And in the process of actually having to pick up your trainers to move them away from the door, you're more likely to say, well, my trainers are in my hand. I'm going to put them on and I'm going to go for that run or that cycle or that gym workout, whatever it might be. And that's just a subtle change in the environment. All you've done is move your shoes from one place to the other. But in the process of that, you've activated a small chance of, taking that action and then taking that action ultimately then goes on to, to build that habit. So yeah, I think environmental design um, is a really, really big one for, uh, for any kind of consistency in life. I, I do this really weird thing. I don't think anybody else does it, but I do. Uh, see if I have to, see if it's like the day before a talk that I have. Say it's in London, which is like an hour flight and it's like an hour drive to Edinburgh to get the point. It's a yeah. long day. So the last time or I do this every time, sorry, it's uh, what I do is I fold up my clothes, but I don't put them in my bag, I lay it next to the bag. So mm. when my alarm goes off first thing in the morning, I wake up and I sort of stack up all my clothes and put them in my bag, and that kind of motivates me to say, oh, hang on, today's a good day. Today, like, I'm doing something that, it's, kind of, it's like tricking my mind into this yeah. positive way of thinking. I, I like that feeling of putting everything in the bag because I'm going somewhere and I feel like I'm actually advancing in my career, so... Yeah, I know what you mean by like setting the shoes by the door. I just kind of I'd set my clothes next to the back. I could easily pack the night before, but 
if I packed the night before, I feel if my alarm went off in the morning, I'd say, I'll just take another 15 minutes in bed. I'd probably end up sleeping in. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a, <laughs> a good environment to get me up in the morning. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, so I run regular events in Glasgow and Edinburgh, and I live in Glasgow, so I can just go to my events in Glasgow. It's not a big deal. But for Edinburgh, I have to get the train across for uh, people outside of Scotland. It's about 45 minutes. And for some reason, and this is nothing on my Glasgow audience, I prefer doing my Edinburgh events, even though they're actually less convenient for me to do. Like I have to get up a little bit earlier to get the train and, and get across and then take all my, my sort of workshop gear with me, all my kind of props and materials and uh, my laptop and things like that. I'll take that all the way there, do the event, and then come all the way back. But I actually prefer it. And I think, in fact, I, I know um, that just as you said, the very act of like getting on the train and I sit there and like I do a little bit of writing and I get a green tea, that act of just, I feel that I'm going and doing something. It's like a little adventure. And it's only to the, the next city. It's not that far away. But I just feel like I'm doing something more worthwhile. And and I'm not, my workshop that I do in Glasgow is equally as worthwhile as the one in Edinburgh, but because there's that little element of anticipation, I guess, I, mm. I get more excited for them. It sounds similar to what you're talking about with kind of the, the pack in the bags. Yeah, de definitely is. Even like, uh, I'd been to London a good few times before last year, but well, last year, because I was working, it felt different. So you getting off the plane thinking I'm here to do my job. It's yeah. like, oh, this so this is the real deal now. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's, it's just the act of kind of going somewhere and doing something. It's, it's kind of like positive mental feedback. Yeah. This is a, a question purely for my interest. Um, so apologies for the audience if, if they're not hugely interested, but something might come out of it that's a bit more kind of uh, sort of generalized. <laughs> What is your prep before you do a speech, before you do a talk? As you said, you've got this little routine of you leave the bags out and, and you put into the suitcase. Do you have any other regular routines and rituals that you do um, before you're guesting on stage? Um, I remember when I was at school, I was in the second last year of school, and uh, I remember we were studying a book. I think it was Lord of the Flies. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a weird book. <laughs> uh, I got half of the year and like I hadn't taken any notes on it whatsoever. And I remember my English teacher told my mum on parents' night that if I was any more laid back it'd be completely vertical. Yeah. And uh not not vertical, horizontal. horizontal yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, if I was any more laid back it'd be completely horizontal. That's kinda that that's kinda happened with my speaking career. So um, before I talk, I'll, uh, I'll do, I'll, pra I'll, only, I'll start practicing my talk maybe two days before, and I'll, do, I'll run through it a couple of times. And then the day before, I'll maybe run it through one last time. And I'm, I, the way I see it is, I don't want to overdo it because I'm just going to keep yeah. tripping myself up on you know, these tiny little mistakes that I'm making and stuff like that. So I'm quite relaxed about it. I said, you, you know what, just let it flow off the tongue. And if you make mistakes, like saying vertical instead of horizontal, yeah. <laughs> it's just because you're human. Yeah. See, a lot of speakers, I feel, are quite proper. And they're speaking yeah. like readers or politicians and stuff like that. And that's not really what I want. I want to just come across as just an ordinary guy just standing on a stage speaking to you like a human being. So... Um, in terms of prep for my talks, I don't actually do that too much. I'll just practice it to the point that I know that I've got the main body of it. And uh, on the day, from this moment forward, on the day, I'll go to whatever city it is. And if it's far away, I'll stay the night after. But up to this point, I've made the mistake of... Yeah, so making a mess of that again, sorry. In the past, I've, I've went down to a trip and I've stayed the night after, which means I've travelled on the day of the talk. Right, yeah. So in October, for example, I went to London and I was awake from like three o'clock in the morning. I had three hours sleep. Got the plane down to London. I was awake all day, arrived early. And by the time my talk arrived at like four o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> I, I can't <laughs> So, but my new part, a new part of my routine going forward is stay the night before, not after. 
Um, other than that, I'm, I'm not that strict about it, to be honest. I just kind of let it flow. I think the more, sometimes the more you plan something, the more you drag the life and the enjoyment out of it. Yeah. Sometimes in life, I think you've just got to let, let it happen and see what happens. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I was actually speaking to somebody about this uh, a couple of nights ago in relation to speaking. I said there's, like a lot of things in life, there's the Goldilocks zone, not too much, not too little. And with speaking prep, if you don't prep enough, then when you're on stage, you don't have the fluency, you hesitate, you arm and uh, you lose your place and you don't come across well. But equally, if you over-practice, you're so rehearsed, it comes across as wooden and you lose this, as you said, that human element of looking like a real human being and not just a robot. So there is this Goldilocks zone where I think you, you do need to practice and you do need to run through and get clear on like, this is what I'm saying. This is what my points are. This is how I want to get it across. This is how I want to connect with my audience. This is what I want them to take away from the speech. And once you can do that to a good level, stop, like, leave it. Don't try and get every word perfect. Just have the, I call them checkpoints. So if you imagine your speech is a journey and you've got the starting point and then the final destination, as long as you know the checkpoints along that journey and you hit them all, it doesn't matter what happens in between the checkpoints. And actually that gives you the space and freedom for spontaneity or creativity. Like my best jokes, I can't do a planned joke. I never do a good planned joke on stage. My best humor always just comes spur of the moment. Somebody has said something or they've asked a question or there's like a, a global event that's going on and I just say something. <clears throat> and sometimes I'm like, oh shit, oh, oh, that was a bit near the mark. Uh, have, I, have I said the right thing? But I'm in the moment and I know it's right because I can feel it. And I actually, I go with the feeling and I say it before I've had time to think about it. But because I'm emotionally connected, the humor works and it, it comes across. So yeah, I totally agree with your approach, that kind of Goldilocks zone of, um, and I think that also applies again, let's take it out of the, the speaking realm. I think that also applies, as you said, to like taking the fun out of things. Sometimes you can over plan lots of different aspects of life. So if you just go into it willy nilly, yeah, you're going to be disorganized and you're going to be a mess. But also if you over plan it, take the fun out of it. So again, that fine balance between planning, but not, super regimented either because uh, yeah starting this career i made like three drafts of a business plan and i was getting really uptight about it and then uh january came this is january last year and i went for it and it turned out half the things that i planned didn't work out yeah <laughs> uh, I, know, I was like I, I spent like a month and a half doing these business plans and it's just been thrown out the window and I thought, if, I'm, if I spend another month and a half planning again, I, I'm, I'm going to lose time. So it's just kind of, yeah, you're just finding that balance and kind of yeah. just slightly editing things here and there. And kind of like I said earlier, just going with like sort of a combination of your gut feeling and your, your head, figuring that out for yourself. And it's, it's, yeah, you'd be surprised at what you can do. Uh, anybody, if you just take that step. I, I don't like a lot of people as well that do want to take that step from out of the norm towards the life that they want out of their comfort zone. A lot of the time they spend too much time planning as well. They've, they've gone as far to recognize that as what they want to do, but they've, they're getting caught up in the early stages because they're still hesitant to yeah. press the start button. So yeah, sometimes you've just got to go with it. Even if you, you can't plan anything in life, well, you can plan some things, but not to the exact detail. As things change, circumstances circumstances come up that you can't foresee, and sometimes you've just got to go with the flow. And if you, if you try your hardest to stick to this regimented plan and it's not working out, you're going to bring yourself a ridiculous level of stress. If I tried to stick to my business plan last year after three months, I'd have grey hair. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just went completely out the window. So yeah, sometimes you just got to go with the flow. Yeah. So I'd like to uh, take this flow 
Liam and um, and start bringing it towards its its endpoint, its destination, as as we've been talking about. And I've got a few last questions to do so. Um, and I say to every guest, just because these are the last few questions, don't feel you need to give short, succinct answers. We can we can elaborate and we discuss on these um, equally as much as we've been doing throughout this entire conversation. Good at going on wild tangents. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And my first of these questions is, what are you grateful for? I'm grateful that, do you know what? I'm grateful that I have just enough limbs left in order to live on my own and be in full control of my life. Honestly, I reckon, see if I've lost like another inch or two off my right arm or my legs, it would be a completely different game. So I'm, I'm actually grateful for how much I'm able to do. Yeah. Which, you know, theoretically, I shouldn't be able to do half the things that I can, but hey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Jesus, you're not even supposed to be here, are you? I, you're not I, supposed I, to be alive. I, yeah, absolutely. What are some of the choices you've made that have made you who you are today? Uh, one, well, one choice was probably just this kind of, I wasn't a choice, it was more like a subconscious choice. I just did it automatically as a very young child to never ever accept no for an answer. To never ever give up. To have this attitude to say, look, do you know what, if I don't push my limits, I'll never know what my true capabilities are. Yeah, brilliant. So yeah, that that, mind, that mindset's got me the places, like I said, that theoretically shouldn't have happened. Yeah, it's funny you should mention uh, being a child because uh, the next question relates to that, and I feel that we're at a very uh, key point in in human history, and and you and me in in our you're in your twenties, aren't you, Liam? Yeah. 20s, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're both in our 20s and we're going to get to see most of this century. I'm, I'm aiming for uh, 2,100. I'll be, I'll be 108 if I get to there. I'm like, yeah, that's it. That's what I'm going for. So I want to see the rest of the 21st century. And, and you know, if, uh, if nothing catastrophic happens, we will see most of it. And I think, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whole situation, it might be quite grim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, if the world doesn't blow up before then yeah, fingers crossed in your back garden. <laughs> <laughs> um of course there's there's the generation who are who are even younger than us and they will see the 21st century and they will inherit um the consequences of the decisions we make now you were talking about consequences earlier and i want you to imagine that you've got a young person with you now they're five years old and you have to give them you, you you're going to say something to them, something that you think is going to help them throughout the rest of their lives and throughout this 21st century that we're, we're going into. What would you be saying to that child? What would I say? That's a tricky one. Do you know what? I would just say your life is what you want it to be. If you have the determination to stick at it, to stay resilient and find something that you enjoy, that you're passionate about. Follow that and never ever take no for an answer. Don't listen to all the naysayers, but live, living in the UK, and particularly Scotland, it's quite a negative and dour atmosphere to live in. <laughs> Tell somebody that you're starting a new career, a new business, that you're going self-employed. A lot of people want to bring you down. I'd say, do you know what, you've just got to stay strong through all the negative talk. What you think of yourself matters more than what anybody else thinks of you. You've just got to stay resilient, stick at it, find something that you want to do. And if you do that, then I believe that you will find happiness and be content with your life. Yeah. Looking at the start of this journey, we're also saying that this has been new month, new year, and of course, a new decade. The, the 2020s are, are coming in. And uh, my theme for this year, 2020, is, of course, 2020 vision. I thought I was being 
incredibly creative and inspired when I, I thought of that a couple of months ago and turns out everyone has had the exact <laughs> same idea 2020 uh, vision uh, years ago. <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, but nonetheless I, this is my theme for the year and it is something that I'm thinking about a lot in terms of the vision that I want to help other people create the people I work with and also the, the vision that I want for myself and my own life for you Liam what is your 2020 vision what do you want to do be create this year it's funny how you said 2020 vision because my i've got like notes on my phone and last year i wrote down like sort of new year's resolutions and like a list and i actually called my list this year 2020 vision so <laughs> definitely not alone on that one yeah <laughs> um, i want to see how many people that i can positively influence I, I, last year, a lot of people when they're sort of in this career, but I had, they would have a financial target. I, I don't, I, I, money doesn't bother me to be honest. My target is to try and double the amount of people that I spoke to last year. So I think that was around about four hundred. So I would like to try and get it, get that into four digits, like a thousand and upwards. But we'll see. Uh, as I want to try and improve my online influence as well, to try and spread to as many people with uh, all four corners of the map and try and help encourage people to take positive actions in their life and improve their 2020 vision. <laughs> yeah. Let's go way into the future, way past the 2020s, well into the 21st century and take it to your last day on earth. And on your last day, your final day, ages away from now, when you look back on the life that you've lived and the time that you've been gifted here on earth, what legacy do you want to have left during that time? Uh, it's funny you bring that up because that's actually one of my primary motivations. It's, uh, have you ever read, oh, was it, is it 12 Habits of, or nine habits of highly effective people. Seven habits of highly effective Seven people. Yes. I forgot yeah. the number. <laughs> one of them was at the start with the end in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. a powerful he, one. He talks about imagine your funeral, imagine what people are going to say about you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, my last day on earth, I want to look back and think that I've positively influenced as many people as I was physically able to. Even if that's five people, that's okay, that's a step in the right direction. As long as I leave this world knowing that I've planted the seed in other people's minds in order to help them make this world a better place and perhaps they'll spread that message on and it'll multiply. And uh, yeah, I just want to pass away knowing that uh, the world was a better place because of my existence, that I didn't just sort of exist for no reason and had no impact. So yeah, I just want to help make it a more enjoyable or livable place as we saw you did into world war three <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah god we'll, we'll need it won't we this will be funny to listen back to in the future and i hope all not <laughs> blow, all of this blows over and and nothing happens we go oh remember when we were worried about world war three or... pinned food for the rest of yeah the <laughs> uh so Liam, for people who've been listening today to this conversation and they've resonated with your message, your philosophy, uh, they'd like to find out a little bit more about who you are, what you do, perhaps they want to hire you for, uh, for some of these speaking gigs and get you in front of those, those people that you want to get in front of this year. Where would you be directing people to to find out a little bit more about you and the work that you do? Right, my name's Liam McKelvey, but my brand name is Zero Limits, but I've spelled it Z E. R O L I M B I T S. So it's like zero limbs, zero yeah, limits. I like that. I thought that was really clever yeah, when I saw it. it. <laughs> Dude, it's an absolute nightmare to spell. See, when I, like, I tried cold calling people last year and trying to like, sell them the services, it didn't really work. But uh, it was an absolute nightmare trying to spell the email. So I was sat there thinking, are they not emailing me because they're not interested or are they not emailing me because they've spelled the name wrong? Because I usually wear my business t-shirt and I just show it like that. But oh, I yeah. So yeah, it's uh, Zero Limits with a B. You'll find me on, primarily find me on Facebook. I've got an Instagram account, a YouTube account and a Twitter account. 
I haven't put much on that yet, but we're hoping to get into that this year. And uh, you'll find me just under Liam McKelvey on LinkedIn. I've also got a website with further details of the services I offer, zerolimits.com. Awesome. We will stick all that in the show notes so people can follow the links and, and enjoy the content. All that's left for me to say, Liam, is thank you for joining me during this conversation today. I've really resonated with your attitudes. I think your attitude is so positive and uplifting and not positive in like a, a woo-woo sunshine and rainbows thinking, but just like if you're in a sit- shit situation, what can you do about it? How can you choose the best action in this moment if there's something you want to do, if there's something you want to change, what's the next step? And go and do it and try and do it as best you possibly can. And I've really resonated with that attitude throughout this conversation. Um, So I'd just like to um, note my appreciation of that, Liam. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's been quite an enjoyable experience. If you've enjoyed today's episode and you'd like to take your education with Author Your Life a little bit further, then I'd love for you to join us in the brand new Author Your Life Academy. The Author Your Life Academy is an online educational community where you can start a new and exciting chapter of your life. In the academy, there is ongoing, extended, exclusive training to help you build the skills that you need to grow and develop in your life. You get to join a community of aspirational story changers who are supporting you, encouraging you, and celebrating with you along your journey. I'm also in there as well, providing tailored specific mentorship through live question and answer sessions and priority access through messaging and emails. If you'd like to enroll in the Academy, you can do so for just $27 a month. That's £20 for those of you in the UK. When you join, you get three awesome bonuses. You get an audiobook, you get an online course, and you get a ticket to one of my live events. So if you're ready to start something new and exciting in your life, come join us in the Author Your Life Academy. You can find out more about how you enroll by going to www.authoryourlife.org forward slash academy. I'd love to see you in there. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd appreciate it hugely if you could head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the podcast. With your review, please be as honest and detailed as you can be. Because with honest and detailed feedback, that helps me to adapt and grow this podcast to most serve you, the listener. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, then make sure you subscribe to the podcast. That way you aren't going to miss any of the future episodes that we've got lined up for you. Until next time, remember that you are the author of your life. You hold the pen and you can write whatever script you want for yourself. So go out today and write yourself a beautiful story.